Uh, so this morning, uh, I want to share some words with you and, and, and some of the word with you this morning. We're going to look at uh, healing. We're going to talk about healing this morning, but uh, uh, just to kind of introduce myself. My name is uh, Pastor Shane Smith. My uh, wife, Jess, is here with us and my lovely daughter, Leah, and also brought along our youth pastors, Katie and Kyle. They're here with us this morning, and uh, so they're hanging out with us and just kind of learning and, and uh, growing along with us. Praise God. Amen. And so uh, we're, we, we come from a little town in Pennsylvania, little, it's, called, it's actually called Littlestown, <laughs> believe it or not. Uh, it's a little town called Littlestown, but we are about 10 minutes outside of Gettysburg. And so uh, we are launching, yeah, like Brother Curry said in May, we are launching Dominion Life Gettysburg, and we are super excited for what God is going to do in Pennsylvania, because how many know Pennsylvania needs this message? Come on. We've already brought it, but they need it even more. Amen. We're going to, I mean, the, the heart of the ministry is definitely the life teams, and we're going we're gonna to be, we're gonna be planning life teams all around Gettysburg and even into Maryland, and, and it's going to be amazing. It's going to be a, a resource. It's going to be a, 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 just a, a, an army barracks. How many know because the church is supposed to be an army barracks? Yeah. Amen. We're, we're training believers to do the work of the Lord. Yes. Amen? Amen? That's what we're here for. We're not here to have church. We're here to be the church. Amen? Yeah. Amen? That's what we're here for. So this morning, we're going to look at the Word, because we, we, got, we got to train, we got to, we got to train hard, we got to, you know, honestly, we got to train harder in here uh, for anything that we'll face out there. Yes. Amen? And so this morning, we're going to look at the Word, and we're going to train, and I want to talk, this, talk to you this morning, I would title this teaching, Practical Healing. Practical Healing. And, and the reason I title it that is because a lot of times we, we talk about healing, which is good, and we, we, we teach on healing, but I want to I take some time and look at the scriptures this morning and actually study out how, not, now, now, now I'm going to preface this, not how did Jesus heal, but how did the disciples heal? Because we, now we, now understand, I'm going to preface this again with this, is we never go off of, we, we don't ever want to be the disciples. In other words, you know, you'll hear people say, and I've heard people even say that, you know, I want to be just like Paul, or I want to be just like Peter, or I want to be just like John, and, and, and we can't do that, because the only one that we want to be like is Jesus. Amen? That's the only one that we want to achieve, is we want to achieve Jesus Christ. It's Christ in us, the hope of glory. Amen? Amen? It's not Peter in us, the hope of glory. It's not Paul in us, the hope of glory. It's Christ in us, the hope of glory. So our prototype, our, 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 our um, bar to meet is Jesus Christ. Amen? He is, he is the bar. He is, he, is, he is the bar that's been raised. And how many of you know as the body of Christ or as uh, ministers to the body of Christ, our job is to raise the bar on you? Yes. Come on. Because that way, when you, when you push harder, I'm going to make you even push even harder than that. Amen? When you run, because how many, you know, a good athlete, when he runs a mile, tomorrow he's going to push for two. Amen? And when he runs two, then he's going to push for three. And when he runs three, he's going to push for four. He's not going to give up. He's going to push harder, he's going to push stronger, and he's going to go harder. And, it, and you know what? It's going to hurt. But how many know resistance hurts? Come on, you, you can't grow, you can't become stronger without your muscles becoming a little, a little uh, uh, um, sore in that, in that sense. Come on. You know, we, we got the word, and I, and I use this analogy with my life team and with our church, and I said, you know, we have the word, and we can eat the word all day, but unless we do the word, we'll never become the word. Amen. See, I look at this, you know, bodybuilding. When you bodybuild, you, you, you lift weights to gain muscle, gain strength, your muscles get bigger. And what do, you, what do bodybuilders usually do? They usually drink uh, some kind of protein, amen? They drink some kind of uh, uh, protein shake. Here's your protein shake. But how many know, if you, just eat, if you just drink protein shakes all day long, what are you going to do? You're going to get big, but you ain't going to get strong, right? You're going to get big, you're going you're gonna to get overweight, but you're not going to get strong, so you've got to, watch this, you've got to drink the word, but then you've got to work it. Come on, you've got, to, you've got to put action to it. You've got to put faith behind it. Why? Because that's where strength comes from. That's where growth comes from. You can't grow until you do. Yep. Are you getting this this morning? Yes, Are you all alive this morning? Yes. Come on, I know it's not. I know, come on. <laughs> I know it's 9 a.m., but come on, we are alive this morning. Amen? Amen. It, this is the day the Lord has made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. Yes. Praise God. All right, let's look at the Word. So we're going to be in Matthew chapter 10. We're going to start there this morning. So if you want to turn with me to Matthew chapter 10, we're going to go to verse 7. And we're going to look at some things that Jesus said, and then we're going to, we're going to look at the disciples. Because a lot of times, I want to talk about practical healing, because a lot of times we talk about healing, we'll, we'll look at what Jesus did, which is amazing. Because Smith Wigglesworth once said, you know, uh, somebody asked him, he said, you know, can you recommend any good books on healing? And he said, absolutely, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. <laughs> 
Come on, these are some really good books on healing. But how many of you know, a lot of times, and I'm just being, just being honest with you, a lot of times tr- Christians get the idea that, well, Jesus healed like that, or Jesus did that because he was Jesus. But how many know you've been brought together with him in union, and now it's Christ in you, right, the hope of glory. You are one with him now, amen? How many know the Bible says what God has joined together? Let no man divide. Amen. Come on, you've been joined. We, we think that's about marriage. That's actually about you and Christ. But yet the church, or I use that term loosely nowadays, because there's a lot of churches out there that claim they're churches, but they're not churches, right? But churches and ministers all across this nation today will try to divide you and Jesus. But you're not divided from him. You're one with him. Amen. Amen. And so our, we, don't, we don't want to strive to be anybody else but Jesus. And we want, to, we want to look at the life of Jesus. But I want to take some time and look at the life of the disciples and see how they healed. And to see what you can actually see that they observed Jesus, they learned from Jesus, and then they did what Jesus did. And we're going to look at that this morning. But we're going to start in Matthew. We're going to look at some of Jesus' words. Matthew chapter 10, verse 7. It says, and as you go, because some of you know this is an as you go ministry. Come on, it's not a, you know, well, we're going to have outreach this week, and so ministry is going to be on Friday. No, ministry is Monday through Monday. <laughs> Come on, ministry is every day of the week. Come on. And so it's an as-you-go ministry. What do you do? You preach saying the kingdom of heaven is at hand. How I many you know the kingdom of heaven is at hand? In other words, the kingdom of heaven is here. You can taste it. You can see it. You can touch it. You can experience it. You can smell it. You can have it. It's yours. It's at hand. Take it now, right? And so Jesus tells us that as we go, we're to preach this gospel. And how many know the word preach there in the Greek is the word caruso, which literally means to, to proclaim with, an, with, a, with a gravity, an authority that must be listened to and obeyed. Amen. So we are to preach the gospel. What we're to say? We're to say the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Verse, verse eight: Heal the sick, cleanse the lepers, raise the dead, cast out demons. Freely you have received, freely give. Now look at some of the words that Jesus said there. What did he say? He said, "Heal the sick." Notice he didn't say, "Pray for the sick." Notice he didn't say, you know, get a, get a prayer chain together, and the more people you get praying, the better results you'll get. He didn't say that, did he? He didn't say, you know, fast and pray in tongues, and, and then maybe go heal the sick. He, no, he just said, heal the sick. See, the problem is in the church is we, wanna, we don't want to be involved. <laughs> right? We just think that we'll pray to Jesus, and Jesus will do everything. But how many of you know, Jesus isn't going to do everything for you. He'll do things for you, but you have to do your part first. Come on. The Holy Spirit is the helper. He's not the doer. You get that this morning. He's the helper, not the doer. In other words, he helps you. And I mean, if I invite somebody up here to come up here and help me, you know, move all this equipment off this stage and, you know, and as soon as I I'm start moving things and then, you know, somebody comes up, maybe Brother Othniel comes up and he stands there and he just watches me. Is he helping me? No, he's just watching me. But if he actually joins in and starts to pick up equipment and move it off of this platform, how many know now he's helping me? See, we've got to work together with the Holy Spirit. See, apart from him, you can do nothing. But with him, you can do all things. So he says, heal the sick, cleanse the lepers, raise the dead, cast out demons. Freely you have received, freely give. See, here's the problem. Most Christians don't realize what they've received. It's quiet this morning. Come on. See, we've got to know what we've received. We've got to know. How do you know what you've received? You get in the Word. You say, well, I don't know what the will of God is. Well, that's the problem. You ain't reading your Word then. Because if you read your Word, you would know what the will of God is. I don't know if it's will to heal. Okay? It's His will to heal. Come on, church, you know this. I know you guys know this. Why? Because when the leper came to Jesus and said, you know, Lord, if thou be willing, would you cleanse me? What did Jesus say? I am willing. In the Greek, that is in the continual sense, meaning that Jesus is always willing to heal. You never have to ask him again, are you willing to heal? Come on. God God is more willing to heal than you think he's willing to heal. I heard a preacher say one time, he says, God is better than you think, so you better change the way you think. Yes, sir. Amen. That is truth. Yeah. You better change the way you think about God, because he is better than you could ever imagine. Yes. 
you imagine how amazing he is? I'm telling you what, you could, you, could think, you could think all kinds of lofty things about how amazing and wonderful and gracious and loving he is. He's even better than that. Yep. Yes. Yes. Amen? And so he tells us here, watch this, freely you have received. So first of all, we got to know what we've received. We've received Christ himself. We've received the Holy Spirit. The very Holy Spirit of God dwells on the inside of you and I. Yes. Come on, you are, I'll say this, you are the Holy of Holies. Yes. <laughs> you are the dwelling place of God. You are the house of God, the seed of God. The very presence of God rests in you. Yes. And how many of you know, the Bible says that anything that touches the altar in the Holy of Holies was made holy. Yes. You see in that? See, anything that touches the altar is made holy. Yes. So anything that touches the altar is made clean. Yes. Anything that touches the altar, it drives out sickness, it drives out disease, it drives out depression, it drives out anxiety, it drives everything out that's not of God. Because it's touched the altar of God. Come on, you're the altar. You're the holy of holies. Now watch this. He says, freely you have received. So we've got to understand, we've received this Holy Spirit. We've received the gospel of the kingdom. We have access to everything our heavenly Father has access to. Yes. And so he says here, you've received it. Now what does he tell us to do? Freely give it. Freely give it. Why? Jesus said in John 10.10, 10, now, we know this. This isn't our focus this morning, but the, he said this at the beginning. He said that the enemy comes to steal, kill, and destroy. Amen. But Jesus said, I've come to give you life and life more abundantly. Come on. See, our focus isn't on the steal, killing, and destroying. Our focus should be on this. Jesus has come to give us life and life more abundantly. What's that mean? That means I have so much life, I've got it to give away. Come on. That means, you know, because when you have something in abundance, that means you have more than enough for yourself and you have extra to give away. Yes. So Jesus says, watch, freely you have received, freely give. Yes. Freely give the life away that I gave to you. Amen. And how many of you know you can't outgive God? Yes. Whatever you pour out, he pours back in. It's not like God's got some kind of life tank up in heaven that's going to run dry one day. He doesn't, <laughs> he is full, he is life. Come on, church. And so now you've received this, and now you've got to give it away. Now, let's look at Mark chapter 16, verse 15. So in Mark 16, verse 15, he says, Go into all the world, preach the gospel to every creature. He who believes and is baptized shall be saved, but he who does not believe will be damned. And these signs will follow those that believe. In my name... Meaning in my name, when that says in my name, how many know what that means? That means in his stead. When the Bible says in my name, that means you're doing it in place of him. Why? Because he's not here now, and now you are God's representative. You are representing Jesus Christ upon this earth, so you are doing it in his stead. Yes. See, you don't go to God for the people. You go to the people for God. Amen. You might want to write that down or get that one, because that's good. You don't go to God on behalf of the people. See, that's Old Covenant. New Covenant, you go to the people on behalf of God. You represent him. Amen? And so now he says this. He says, he says but he who believes is, will be damned, or does not believe will be damned. And these signs shall follow them that believe. So how many know signs should follow the believers? Yes. Now, believers should not need signs. If you need a sign, you're not a believer. Why? Because if you need a sign, quite honestly, you're saying you don't believe this. You need, you need to see something physical for you to believe it. But how many of you know we don't walk by sight? Yes. We walk by faith. Because the reality is, is if you pray for somebody and then you're immediately looking at sight, you're immediately looking at, is there a change? Is there a difference? You're not walking by faith. You're walking by your senses. See, faith doesn't care what it sees. Faith cares what it believes. Amen. Come on. Amen. So faith cares what it believes. Now watch this. He says, these signs shall follow those who believe in my name. In other words, in my stead, they will or they shall cast out demons. Now how many know the, the Greek word shall there is the strongest Greek word you can use that will indicate that something will absolutely happen. 
Come on. So that's here's the thing. If you're not casting out demons, then you're not a believer. Because you, you follow along this morning. Okay, come on. Now watch. He says, in my name they shall, they will absolutely cast out demons. He says, they shall speak with new tongues. He says, they shall take up serpents. Now we're not going to bring out the snakes after church. And, okay, we're not going to do that here. <laughs> okay. But, but the reality is, is listen, if you got bit by a snake or you needed to take it up, guess what? You could do it and it wouldn't even hurt you. Amen. Remember Paul? Yes, sir. Come on. He just shook that thing off. See? That, you have to understand, there's so much life in you, it doesn't matter what poison tries to get into you, just yeah. shake it off. Yeah. It can't, why? Because it can't touch you. Amen. He says, they shall, watch, they shall take up serpents, and if they drink anything deadly, it shall by no means harm them. They shall lay hands on the sick, and they shall recover. Amen. Come on, church. So the Bible says that believers shall lay hands on the sick. That means if you're not laying hands on the sick, you're not a believer. Because it is an identifying marker showing you that this is what you believe, and I follow Jesus. I pick up my cross, and I follow him. And so Jesus laid his hands on some sick people, so we've got to lay our hands on some sick people. Yes. See, you can't be afraid of sickness. Yes. You've got to understand. I like our brother Curry says, I'm a divine bug zapper. Nothing can touch me. Nothing can get on me. Why? Because I have the holy of holies on the inside of me. Amen. Did you say bug zapper? A divine bug zapper. Absolutely. You are a div- Why? Because like, when, when 2020 hit and COVID hit, what, what did everybody do? Everybody ran scared. Uh-huh. Yeah. See, the enemy, the enemy actually won that battle. Why? Because he made everybody run, tucked tail. Now, I'm not saying you all did it here, but I'm saying most people, most churches closed the doors, they ran, they tucked tail. Right? And, and now, what, what do they have to stand on? Right? Are they going to open back up and start having healing services? Right? What, what's, what, what is their testimony? Oh, yeah, we ran in fear. Why? The Bible says the righteous are as bold as lions, they are not fearful. Right. Nothing shall harm us. Come on. If the church actually believed, Luke 10 19, that we can trample on serpents and scorpions, and nothing by no means shall harm us. Come on, imagine what we could do. Yeah. Now watch this. They shall, watch what it says here. They shall lay hands on the sick, and they shall recover. Yes. Amen. See, there's a promise. If you do your part, God does his part. Yes. Amen. Remember I said, he's not the doer, he's the helper. God's not going to come down here and just, you know, heal people without, you know, you being a part of it. If you lay hands on the sick, they shall recover. God gave us that promise. And how many know that all the promises of God are yes and amen in Christ Jesus? So one of the promises is if I do my part, he does his part. Why? Because I'm full of faith and he's faithful. Watch, he fulfills my faith. Come on, church. Now, verse 19. So then... After the Lord had spoken to them, he was received up into heaven, and he sat down at the right hand of God. And they, who's that? The disciples. They went out and preached everywhere, the Lord working with them and confirming the word through accompanying signs and wonders. Amen. Amen. Now watch this. Watch what it says there in verse 20, because let's look at this. This is key. This is crucial. He says in verse 20, and they went out and preached everywhere. How many know when Jesus walked in ministry and even the disciples, when they did this, they went out and they either, they either healed and then preached or they preached and they healed. But how many know the word, watch the word, the word was confirmed with signs following. Yes. So if the word's being preached and there is no signs, then it must not be the word. See, the word that we preach must have signs following. Yes. How many know we got some signs? Come on. And we don't, here's the thing, we don't need them, but we got them. We don't chase after them, they chase after us. Come on. And so here, we watch, God confirms his word with signs following. Now, how how many know, isn't it amazing that we have a gospel that works? Yes. Hallelujah. Love it. I'll I'll share this with you real quick. We, um, it was a couple weeks ago, it was about two weeks ago, I got a phone call from uh, one of my life team members. And uh, she had said to me, she said, Pastor Shane, this is a, this is, this is, it was, it was, you know, near death, it was a death, death situation. And this lady was in the hospital, it was a friend of hers that she knew through her church. And, and, um, 
So she called me, it was, like a, it was like a Thursday night, it was a Thursday evening late, and she called me and said, Pastor Shane, would you be able to meet me at the hospital first thing tomorrow? And she goes, this lady is, is literally on her deathbed. She was taken to the hospital, uh, unresponsive, has an extremely high fever. Um, she was diagnosed with, uh, she was diagnosed, she does not have that, but she was diagnosed with uh, brain cancer. And so the situation is not good, the husband is distraught, um, they're not giving her long, and so would you meet me there first thing tomorrow morning, and can you, you go up there and can we minister to her? And I said, absolutely. Why? Because that's what Jesus would do. See, when the Roman centurion came to Jesus, and, and the Roman centurion said, listen, my, ser- my servant lays home at the point of death, what did Jesus say? I'll come heal him. Jesus didn't say, oh, well, you know, give me some time to think about it. Give me some time to pray on it. You know, I got to fast. I got to, you know, I got to get a ram of word from God. I got to, no, no, no. He says, I'll come heal him. Yeah. Right? And so I said, absolutely. I will be there first thing tomorrow morning. We'll take care of this. Right? We get there. We go up to the room. I don't know this woman from, from, from anybody. I don't know who she is. Right? This, now, this, this lady that's part of my life team, she knows her, but I don't know this woman. Right? And so we go up and we go into the room and... Uh, you know, she introduces, well, she, she introduces me, and I come over, and at this point, her eyes are just literally, I mean, she's unresponsive for the most part. I mean, she can acknowledge that I was there. She could hear my voice, and so I just said, okay, I said, I, said, I told uh, um, Carolyn, it was her name, I told her, I said, get behind me, put your hands on my back. I said, we're just going to push life into her. I said, and she is going to be good in the name of Jesus. And so I, I laid my hands on her, and I went to town. I mean, I, was, I wasn't quiet about it, because, I mean, you, you, can't, you, don't, you, don't, uh, you don't whisper demons out. Right? Uh-huh. You, you, don't, you don't coddle them. You don't play with them. You tell them to leave. Uh-huh. If someone breaks into your home, you don't say, um, hey, please, can you leave? No. You say, get out! Uh-huh. Why? Because if not, it's not going to end well for you. <laughs> yes. Right? And so you tell the demons to get out. So I went to town, and, and, and as I was laying my hands on her, I looked out the, the hospital door, and there stood a team of at least six doctors <laughs> watching me. And they're, they're all like this. Right, and so I get done. And no, my thing only takes thirty seconds. So I get done. I step back. I look at this woman. And I say, "Is there anything else you need?" And by this point, she's almost sitting up in bed, eyes wide open at me, looking at me. She says, "No." She goes, "Thank you so much for coming today." Right, and and Carolyn looks at me. She's like, she's, "We're walking out of we're walking out of the room. We walk past the team of doctors. We're like, all right, we're done. You guys can go in now. You know, we walk past them and they're all looking at us like, you know, what just happened?" Right. We get in there, and so we leave. We we leave. And Carolyn looked at me, and she goes, did you see that? I was like, absolutely, I saw that. But I don't look for that. Why? I know that's going to happen. I don't need to see it happen, but I know that's going to happen. Now, here's the cool thing. Watch this. Sunday, that was a Friday morning. Sunday afternoon, I text the husband, the, uh, the husband of this woman that was in the hospital, because I just wanted to check up. I just wanted to see, hey, how's she doing? You know, what's going on? And so all I get back is this picture. She's sitting up in bed. She's got her clothes on. She's so full of life. She's so full. I mean, she's getting discharged. She's coming home. In on Thursday night, ready to die, home Sunday morning, full of life and ready to go. Come on. That's God. Come on. That's God. See, amen. that's what, you know what? Because we, we freely we've received, we freely give. We give that life away. So God, watch this in verse 20. And they went out and preached everywhere, the Lord working with them and confirming the word through accompanying signs and wonders. Now let's go to Acts chapter 3. Acts chapter 3, we're going to start in verse 1. Acts chapter 3, starting in verse 1. We know this story as... The, uh, the story of Peter and John are going up to the temple at the hour of prayer. And it says here in verse 1, Now Peter and John went up together to the temple at the hour of prayer, the ninth hour. And a certain man, lame from his mother's womb, was carried, whom they laid daily at the gate of the temple, which is called Beautiful, to ask alms from those who entered the temple. Who, seeing Peter and John about to go into the temple, asked for alms. And fixing his eyes on him with John, Peter said, look at us. Yes. Now, here's the thing I want to tell you. First thing, they've already made, according to the backwards church, Peter and John have already made two mistakes. They haven't made it to the temple to get prayed up yet. Because the church would tell you, you better be prayed up before you go out and heal the sick. Right? They ain't even made it to the temple yet. Right? And here's the second part. Now they're telling, here's the other thing that, that the, uh, the backwards church would tell you. Oh, don't have people look at you, have them look at Jesus. Well, the only Jesus they're going to see is you. 
Come on. He's seated at the right hand of the Father, and now I'm his representative. Yes. Right? Amen. So Peter says, look at us. Yes. Why? Because we've got something to give you. Hell. Come on, church. And so now here's the thing. When you walk in confidence and you walk in boldness and you walk in authority, to the untrained eye, it'll look like arrogance. Uh-huh. Right. right? You say, oh, look at me. What, who, what, what do you got? What do you, who, who are you? I'm God's son. Come on. Aren't you, are you not God's children? Yes. Yes. Come on. Then you should be able to go to the sick people and say, hey, look at me. I got something to give you. Yes. I got something to bless you with. Glory. Right? And so he says, now watch. Peter says, look at us. And so watch this. Verse 5. So he gave them his attention, expecting to receive something from them. Now, how many know? I bet he wasn't expecting to get healing. Right. <laughs> He was, because what was he doing? He was there begging alms. He was there asking for silver and gold, right? And so now, now Peter's like, listen, l- look at me. I, I, you know, I got something I'm going to give you. And, and so this, this lame man was like, oh, I'm, gonna, I'm expecting to receive something from these guys. Then Peter said in verse 6, silver and gold I do not have. But what I do have, in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. Now watch what Peter just said. He says, I don't have silver and gold. I don't have what you're wanting, but I've got something to give away. I do have something. And what I do have, I give to you. Now, here's the thing you got to realize. Remember, we're looking at practical healing. We're looking at doing healing the way it should be done. Do you notice Peter praying for this man? All he does is say, hey, fix your eyes on me. Look at me. I have something I'm about to give you. If you just give me your attention for a minute, I'm going to bless you with something. Right. And so he says, now, what he, now here's the here's the blessing. Here's the thing that Peter's given away. He says, in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, again, in his stead, I represent him. He says, rise up and walk. Now, verse seven. And he took him by the right hand, lifted him up and immediately. Everybody say immediately. Immediately. immediately his feet and ankle bones received strength. What is that? That's a working of miracles. See, you've got to know that you've got something to give away. Yes. See, when you know you've got something to give away, you'll take people by the hand and say, hey, rise up and walk. Yes. Stand up and walk. Receive strength. Why? Because I've got strength to give. Yes. Right? You don't see Peter praying for the man. You don't see Peter and John getting together and holding hands and singing Kumbaya and trying to get the atmosphere set and getting everything in order. That way the, the miracle can happen. How many of you know when you walk into the room, you are the atmosphere? Yes. And if the atmosphere ain't there, change it. Yes. Bring the atmosphere. Yes. Make it happen. Preach the gospel when opportunity presents itself and when it does not. This is what we do. We are the opportunity. Come on. And so he says, look at me. He says, he says, in the name of Jesus Christ, rise up and walk. He took him by the right hand, lifted him up, and immediately his ankle bones received strength. So he leaped up, or leaping up, stood and walked and entered the temple with them, walking and leaping and praising God. Praise God. Now let's go forward, because just for time's sake, let's jump forward a little bit here. Let's go to Acts chapter 5. We're going to look, I said, we're looking at some examples. Acts chapter 5, verse 12 says, And through the hands of the apostles, many signs and wonders were done among the people. Through whose hands? Through the hands of the apostles, the disciples, right? So it wasn't through Jesus' hands. Why? Because it was through their hands. Why? Because their hands are Jesus' hands. See, you've got to realize it ain't your hands laying on people. I mean, it is and it ain't. (laughs) Your hands now belong to God. Why? Because when you gave your life to God, you now belong to God. The Bible says to present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. Your body is not your own anymore. Your mouth isn't your own anymore. The the very words that come out of your mouth are not your own anymore. They are God's. Your feet belong to God. So where your feet go, God goes. You know, I used to hear a minister one time, he said, you know, uh, we've got to practice the presence of God. And I thought, first I thought about that, I thought, what does he mean, practice the presence of God? And then I got it. What he was saying is this, we've got, we got to practice the presence of, the God, of God in the sense of that I've got to realize that everywhere I go, God goes. I carry him, right? And so when I go into Walmart, guess what? He goes into Walmart, right? When I go into my workplace, he goes into my workplace, 
Come on. When I, when I go into the marketplace, he goes into the marketplace. Everywhere, I, when I walk into my home, guess what? God walks into my home. Because he's with me, right? And so the, the, the apostles realized this, and many signs and wonders were done among, through their hands among the people. And they were all with one accord in Solomon's porch. Yet none of the rest dared join them, but the people esteemed them highly. And believers were increasingly added to the Lord, multitudes of both men and women, so that they brought the sick out into the streets and laid them on beds and couches. Now, that word couches literally in the Greek means pallets. So at this point in Jerusalem, people are bringing the sick out of the streets. They're laying them on beds and even wooden pallets, basically wooden stretchers, right? And so they bring them out that watch, that at least the shadow of Peter passing by might fall on some of them. Now watch this. Now, Peter's not, okay, I want you to understand something, because a lot of people have this idea that Peter was out there like waving a shadow over people and healing people. That's not what it was. See, the people had set their faith so much so that they said, if I'll just push my sick person out, my, my sick family member out on the pallet, and if even Peter can't get to him to touch him, I know that even if Peter's shadow passes over him, they'll be healed. See, the people set their faith for that. It wasn't Peter. Peter had nothing to well, Peter had nothing to do with it. It was the God and Peter that did it. Right. right? And so here, now watch, again, another example of healing that you don't even have to touch people and they get healed. Yes. People should get healed just by you being around them. That's right. Yeah. Why? Because the presence of God should just emanate from you. Yeah. You should be so full of his glory, so full of his presence that when people get around you, they get they get wet. <laughs> Why? Because that Bible says, out of your belly shall flow rivers of living water. Yes. Amen. Right? People get around me, they should just be able to drink of God and get free and get delivered, right? See, that happened with Jesus. Jesus' ministry became so prevalent that people realized, if we can just get around this guy, we'll be set free. And it became so much so that if they said, if we, even if we just touch him, and so the crowds would surround Jesus. I mean, look at the book of Mark. There was multiple times where the crowds pushed against Jesus. So much so, at one point in Mark, it says that he had a little boat made ready in case he had to make, make an escape because he actually was worried that he would be crushed. Yes. See, this is the power that we walk in. Yes. See, we've got to realize that this is on the inside of us, right? And Peter, now watch this. They're, they're bringing all these sick people out. They're bringing multitudes of sick people out, laying them on beds, laying them on couches, that at least the shadow of Peter would pass by them and might yes. fall on some of them. Glory. Verse 16. Also, a multitude gathered from surrounding cities to Jerusalem, bringing sick people, all those who were tormented by unclean spirits, and they were all healed. Yes. Now notice that. That's the disciples. Now, how many times in Jesus' ministry, when all the sick people were brought to him, when the multitudes came to him, the Bible says that they were all healed. Now guess what? Even the disciples are now walking in this. This proves that they saw Jesus, they witnessed Jesus, they observed Jesus, they learned from Jesus, and then they did it themselves just like Jesus would do it. Yes. See, that's why I said this morning, your, your focus on who you pay attention to is Jesus. Yes. Not Peter, not Paul. We're looking at these guys, but our focus is Jesus. Why? Because we want to model him. We want to become him. We want to be so full of the word that we, like Jesus, the word was made flesh. I want to be so full of this that I actually become this, and I walk this out just like Jesus walked it out. Yes. Right? And so here now, let's look at Acts chapter 9. We've got, we got less than 10 minutes, so we've got to push. <laughs> Acts chapter 9, verse 32. It says, now it came to pass, as Peter went through all of the parts of the country, that he also came down to the saints who dwelt in Lydda. And there he found a certain man, Aeneas, who had been bedridden eight years and was paralyzed. And Peter said to him, Aeneas, Jesus the Christ heals you. Arise and make your bed. Then he arose immediately, so all who dwelt at Lydda and Sharon saw him and turned to the Lord. How many know healing is the dinner bell of the gospel? It, you know, it's like God ringing it and say, it's, it's hot, it's ready, come and get it. 
Come and taste and see that I'm good. Watch, people in this town, people in this community saw this amazing miracle and they all turned to the Lord. Yes. Now watch this. He was paralyzed or bedridden eight years and paralyzed. Watch what Peter said. We're looking at practical healing this morning. We're looking at doing things the way Jesus would do them. Why? See, Jesus would have did the same thing. Jesus would have looked at him and said, arise, make your bed, get up. See, we've got this idea, and, and we've, got to, we've got to honestly destroy this idea that when we go out and we minister to the sick, see, we, we say things like we go out and pray for the sick. Really, we don't pray for the sick. Nowhere in the Bible does it say pray for the sick. It says heal the sick, yeah. right? So we've got to get this idea, this change in our thinking that we don't go pray for the sick. Now, I know we use this language, use this vocabulary, because we always talk about prayer and praying and this and that. But when we go out, we minister to the sick. We minister healing. We give life away. We've got to get away from the ideas that we've got to say long, lengthy prayers or we've got to say things in a certain way. All Peter said here was arise, pick up your bed. Yeah. And the man did it. Why? Because when you understand that you have authority, you can speak a word and it'll happen. Yes. Why? Because the Bible says where the word of a king is, there's power. Yes. And how many know we've been made kings and priests unto him? Yes. So when we speak, guess what? Things change. Yes. You've got to realize your words hold weight. Your words have power. Death and life are in the power of the tongue. And those who love it will eat its fruit. First Peter, First Peter chapter four, I think First Peter chapter four, I think it's the eleventh verse says this: If anyone's going to speak, let him speak the oracles of God. Yes. In other words, if you're going to say anything at all, it better be what God would say. The only thing that better exit out of your mouth is what God would say about that situation. And how many know Isaiah declares or, or describes our God? He is the God who declares the end from the beginning. He is the God that calls the things that are not as though they are. I mean, we're not, here's the thing, church. We're not calling the things that are, are, that are as though they're not. So in other words, we're not lying to ourselves. I'm not, you know, if you, if you get sick or you, you know, you got a, you know, say you got a fever, right? And you're walking around the house saying, oh, I don't have a fever. 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 Okay, stop it. Right. right? You're just trying to call the things that are as though they're not. You're to call the things that are not as though they are. So what do you do? Father, I thank you that I walk in divine health. Father, I thank you. By your stripes, I am healed. Father, I thank you that you live on the inside of me. And because you live on the inside of me, nothing can come against me. And I walk in health. I walk in healing. I prosper in everything that I do. What do you do? You're calling the thing that is not as though it is. Yes. Right? And so we've got to realize that our words have power. Our words hold weight. And what we do speak will come to pass. Yes. Peter says, arise and make your bed. Yes. And he does. Acts chapter 14, verse 8. Now in Lystra, a certain man without strength in his feet was sitting, a cripple from his mother's womb, who had never walked. This man heard Paul speaking, Paul observing him intently, and seeing the, that he had faith to be healed, said with a loud voice, Stand up straight on your feet. And he leaped and he walked. Yes. Again, was any prayer said? Yes. All he said, watch, the only thing that we do see is Paul intently observing this man. Yes. What does that mean? That in the spirit, Paul could see he had faith. Yes. And he saw that he had faith. So he said to that man, he says, watch, watch what he says. And he says it, now watch, he doesn't say it with a quiet voice. He says it with a loud voice. Yes. Why? Because lions roar. Come on, Come on church. Right? He says, stand up straight on your feet. It's a command. Right? He commanded that man to do that, right? And what did the man do? Whoop, up and walk and he leaped. Come on. Acts chapter 14, verse 19. It says here in Acts 14, 19. Then the Jews from Antioch and Iconium came there, and having persuaded the multitudes, they stoned Paul and dragged him out of the city, supposing him to be dead. Now notice, they stoned Paul, and it says they supposed him to be dead. Usually when you were stoned, you were dead. Okay, So supposing that he was dead. Now watch this in verse 20. However, when the disciples gathered around him. Now watch this. This is Paul's disciples. right? And so here, here's what I want you to see. 
right? G- Paul was directly linked to Jesus, okay? Paul's disciples, the disciples that were around Paul, right, are now surrounding Paul. Now watch what it says. The disciples that were with Paul surrounded him or gathered around him. Now watch what it says. And he rose up. See? See, we've got the glow. Come on, church. We've got life inside of us. Paul is stoned and left for dead. All they did was get around him. And watch. They get around. And as they get around him, he just stands up, right? And they go to the next city. See, you've got life to give away. You've got life to impart into every situation. Here's the thing, though. Jesus said we'd have trials. We'd have troubles. But he said, be of good cheer. I've overcome the world. What's he saying? I've overcome it so you can too. Don't be worried. Don't be fearful. You're going to have problems. You know, Paul had problems. He was stoned and left for dead. Yes. But yet his disciples got around him and raised him back up. Glory. Got two minutes. Let's hit this next one. Acts 16. <laughs> Might have to do... Hey, I'm coming back down in April. Maybe we'll do part two. <laughs> but Acts 16, 16. Watch what it says here. It says, Now it happened as we went to prayer, a certain slave girl possessed with a spirit of divination met us who brought her master's much profit by fortune-telling. This girl followed Paul and us and cried out, saying, These men are the servants of the Most High God who proclaim to us the way of salvation. Now notice, you know, this is now this is dealing with an unclean spirit. This is dealing with casting out a devil. You have to realize there's not much difference between healing the sick and casting out a devil. Why? Because every sickness and disease should be treated like a devil. Now, I will say this, just because maybe you're sick or maybe you have disease or whatever doesn't mean you have a devil, but we can tell that the devil left his mark upon you. Yes. Sin and sickness are fruit from the same tree. Yes. Right? The wages of sin is death. Yes. Right? And the wages of sickness is what? Because what's, what's, the, ultimate, what's the ultimate end goal of sickness? Right? And so here's the thing. We, now, you say, well, is it a demon? Do I need to cast out a demon if someone's sick? Do I need to, you know, do I need to minister healing? Yes. Why? Because that's what John Lake said. You treat every devil, or you treat every sickness like it's a devil. Because it is. You've got to treat it like it's a devil, right? Now, here we're dealing with devils, not so much sickness. But watch what this girl says. She doesn't say anything wrong, does she? She says, these men are the servants of the Most High God who proclaim to us the way of salvation. Now, the problem is, is all she would do is follow Paul and Barnabas around and just complete, just repeat this, repeat this, repeat this, repeat this. And watch what it did. It became a distraction. See, just because it sounds good don't mean it's not the enemy. See, I remember Dr. Lester Summerall, I was watching him one time and he said this. He said, he was preaching one time and he said he was, as he was ministering, he was delivering the word of God. And I don't know if it was a uh, brother Curry can tell me, correct me if not, if I'm wrong, but it was either a man or a woman was sitting on the front row and was a woman, thank you. And it was a woman and she would sit there and she would literally over and over and over again say, amen, 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 right? And doctor, I remember Dr. Lester Summer was like, oh my, Jesus, help me. Like he couldn't focus on his word. He couldn't focus on delivering the word, right? And finally he said, he just turned to the woman and said, come out. And she was delivered. Now think about that. Was she saying anything wrong? No. no. She's just saying amen. But it became a distraction. See, the enemy is going to try to distract you. Just because I said, just because it sounds good don't mean it is God. Yeah. Right? And so here this, this girl is run, running around. She's, she's saying, these are the, the, the man, men of the servants of the Most High God who proclaim to us the way of salvation. And verse 18, and she did this for many days. And Paul, greatly annoyed, <laughs> I love that scripture, he was annoyed. And he says, and he said to the spirit, now notice, he doesn't address the girl. He says to the spirit, I command you in the name of Jesus, come out of her. And he came out that very hour. Now here's the thing. Was any prayer said? No, it was just a good good old come out. And he came out. See, you can't counsel demons out. You cast them out. You don't disciple them out. You, re- you forcefully remove them as if they were a, a, uh, um, someone on, on, on your land as a trespasser. You forcefully remove a trespasser. You forcefully remove demons. How many, we don't coddle with the things of God. We, or we don't coddle the things of the enemy. We don't coddle demons. We don't play with demons. We destroy demons. Yes. Come on. Amen. Now look at this. We're going to have to end here because my time is up. 
So let's end here. Let's stop here. Um, actually, let's read just one more verse. Acts 19, verse 11. We'll end here. It says, Now God worked unusual miracles by the hands of Paul, so that even handkerchiefs or aprons were brought from his body to the sick, and the diseases left them, and the evil spirits went out of them. Now, this is amazing. Now, watch this. No prayers involved at all. See, here's the thing we have to realize, church. Just because the Bible does say, lay hands on the sick and they shall recover, that's just one way of doing it. See, there are multiple ways of doing this. And we know, as Brother Curry says all the time, the methods are not sacred. The message is. Whatever method we choose to deliver healing, God will use it. If we do it through a word, if we do it through a look, if we do it through a cloth, if we do it through laying on hands, whatever we choose to do, God will work with it, he will use it, and people will get set free. All they did was take cloths, items from Paul's body, delivered them to the sick, or watch, even the demon possessed, and they were delivered. Why? Because there's so much life on us that it gets on this stuff, and guess what? It sets them free. Isn't this good? It's good to have a gospel that works. So we're looking at practical things this morning. We're looking at ways to minister in healing and understanding. It's not prayer. It's faith. See, whatever you set your faith for, is what you shall have. Amen? Amen. Amen. Good morning. Good morning. Take some time, stretch your legs, uh, get to introduce yourselves to one another, and we're going to take a break, and we'll be back. Amen. Good morning. This is a day the Lord has made. We are so glad, and we rejoice in it, right? Hallelujah. Give you five minutes to sit down. Praise God. All right. Welcome. Welcome, everybody. God bless you in Jesus' name. We would uh, like to welcome everyone here, everyone online. And if you are new here, could you please stand up and tell us where you're from? We would love that. So we have, don't be shy. Any new people here today? Amen. Yes, brother, where are you from? West Palm? Florida. Welcome. Bless you, brother. Bless you. Amen. Anybody else? Anybody else going once, going twice? All right. Well, we bless you. If you didn't stand up, we welcome you anyway, okay, in Jesus' name. All right. So we'd like to dismiss the children for Bible study. So go have fun in Jesus. Thank you so much. Now we're going to pass out the ministry cards. Can you please raise your hand if you want one? And please state what you cannot do on those cards. Because you will be doing them by the end of the service. In Jesus' name. All right. So we have uh, the Dominion Life uh, Seminar coming up March 30th through April 1st in Lake Charles, Louisiana. And you can register online at www.jglm.org. Uh, we have the Dominion Life Seminar here. That's going to be great as well. April 27th through April 29th. Also register online at jglm.org. And that's here in Plano, Texas. Uh, we also have the Dominion Life Seminar in Gettysburg, Pennsylvania. May 11th through May 14th. Register online, please, at jglm.org. Discipleship class with Pastor Shane. This Monday at 630. What did I just say? And who is teaching? Very good, very good. You're doing so well. All right. So we'd like to also inform you that we have several outreaches a month. We have door-to-door -door evangelism, hospital visits, elderly care facilities that we go to, mobile food banks, prayer meetings to end sex trafficking and abortion, a weekly prayer meeting here at the church, and so much more. Uh, if you want to be notified about these outreaches, please reach Pastor Othniel and... Uh, I'll give you his email address, church at jglm.org. And then we also are looking for people who want to lead an outreach because we are expanding into uh, the highways and byways of our communities. If you would like to lead an outreach, please see Brother Aaron or simply reply to the outreach emails. All right. So we have DHT training Wednesday nights at 630, Thursday morning prayer at 7 a.m. here. And we do do baptisms at the end of every month following a conference here at headquarters, please sign up and go to dominionlifechurch.org and do fill out the baptismal form. 
All right, we'd like to receive the offering right now. Heavenly Father, we thank you. <laughs> We praise your name, Lord God. We thank you for the, all that you have given us, Lord God, and we are going to give it back to you, Father, for the uh, just the opening of the, the gospel, Father. So we thank you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen. So be it. So be it. All right. Oh, yes, 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 yes. Here we go. My favorite part. I came to the JGLM healing rooms in rough shape. This guy had gotten the, Okay. So he could not stay in a hotel, in his room. Um, he, uh, actually could, he actually could not handle any indoor environments. He was living in his car and had become allergic to that as well. I had become allergic to most foods as well. Had to even specially wash my clothes, otherwise I could be highly reactive to normal detergents. Immediately upon leaving the office, I tried something I couldn't and aggressively ate a bunch of previous food triggers. No problems. I had reacted to eating an apple a week earlier, and here I was eating processed chocolate bars, etc., which would have been disastrous previously. I went to the hotel, also no problem as I spoke scripture over myself. The linens there that night, also no problem. Two days later, continued to do well and tolerated foods and environments and anything on my skin. Praise God. The pr prayer claws have proven very helpful when old symptoms have tried to return. Praise God, right? Amen. Amen. He was in turmoil. He was in despair when he came in. But to the glory of God, completely healed and whole in Jesus' name. Yes, Lord Jesus. Okay. Uh, for years, I had pain in both my knees and had to take supplements daily. I didn't take them. I might have been able to go three days before the pain made it difficult for me to even walk. After watching three different versions of the DHT training, I knew in my heart that to continue taking the supplements was contrary to what I now believed. So I stopped taking them. It's now been seven months and haven't needed them since. I've also watched four more versions of the DHT training. Glory be to God. Glory be to God. Glory be to God. So this person had a small size... Uh, growth on her right breast. Uh, she said, after receiving a prayer cloth, uh, that, that breast issue was completely gone. Praise God, I don't feel anything any longer in Jesus' name. Okay. I'm going to try to navigate through this long testimony here, but it's amazing. So this man had Parkinson's disease, okay? I commanded all Parkinson's symptoms to go and bow to Jesus. Also, all pain and tremors. I commanded all spirits of infirmity, weakness, oppression, and torment to go and enter no more. He said his pain range was 9 to 10. When I called him, as I kept blasting it, it went to 6. Then it went to 3. Then it went to 0. He said he could not stand. I told him he must stand then, and he said he was now standing. So not only were the tremors gone, he was now standing in Jesus' mighty name. Parkinson's disease, come on! Come on. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Praise God. And I get testimonies day after day after day after day what the power of God can do. So we just, we bless you, God. Thank you so much. All right. So right now we're going to have a um, video. So in Jesus' name, enjoy and God bless you all. Well, good morning. Welcome to Dominion Life Church here in Plano, North Dallas, Texas. We want to welcome everyone this morning. I'm sorry I can't be there, but I am out preaching the gospel as I'm supposed to be doing. But uh, you should know this. We have a good brother and sister in the Lord that have been working with us for some time. They've been life team leaders with us. And now in May, they're going to be launching a new church, a new JGLM Dominion Life Church, you know, whatever list you want to give to the name, but uh, they're going to be starting that in Gettysburg, Pennsylvania. Matter of fact, we'll be up there in May to help launch that and do a Dominion Life seminar. So we're really excited and we just want, we know you're going to enjoy listening to Shane and Jess because as I said, they're great life team leaders and uh, we're looking forward to it. And you can know this, if it's one thing, if I invite people to speak when I'm there, because I can clean up the mess, but Whenever I invite somebody when I'm not there, you know I trust them. So listen up, pay attention, they're going to bless you. So until I get back, God bless you. See you again soon. Amen. 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 Am I on? Am I on?
We good? Can you all hear me? Yeah. We're good? Okay. Praise God. You guys good? Yeah. Good morning. Yeah. Good morning. I'm, this is going to be a good day. Amen? Yeah. Who's excited? Yeah. Come on. Amen. Praise God. Praise God. We absolutely, I'm my Pastor Shane Smith and my wife uh, Jess and uh, my beautiful wife Jess is here. Jess, wait, raise your hands. Everybody knows who you are. There you go. Yeah. And my, and my daughter Leah is here as well. Amen. Leah, raise your hand. There you go. <laughs> and then also, our, we brought our youth pastors along, uh, Katie and Kyle Mummert. So they're here as well. Amen. And so you get a chance to say hi to them. But it is an honor and a privilege to be here this morning uh, uh, to fill um, some big shoes, quite honestly. I uh, consider Brother Curry uh, a mentor and father in the faith. And he has discipled me from a distance, which is amazing. That, that can be done nowadays. Amen. You can actually disciple and mentor people from a distance. And um, you know, even though it's like we have that distant relationship, I feel like we're close. And it's interesting because um, we actually stopped in here yesterday. It was before the Hispanic service, and um, you know, I stopped in here and was talking to Gigi, my wife, and I. And, and uh, I said, the first time I stepped in here, I've been I've been watching for you know over a year and a half. Honestly, I've been watching online, and and I said, you know, when we stepped in here yesterday, I said it feels like we're home. And I said, this is feels. I mean, it's like you you feel like you're a, you're a family from a distance, but you get in here and it's like. Ah, this feels good. This feels good in here. It's like, this is home, you know, which is amazing. So um, you all feel like family. It's like, you know, I don't really know you yet, but you know, we're going we're gonna to get to know each other as we grow together, and it's going to be amazing, but it, it, it feels amazing. So amen? Amen. amen. Are you guys ready to get into the Word? Yes. Praise God. All right, so I'm going to talk to you this morning. I have a message on my heart I want to share with you, and um, I'll tell you, one of the, one, honest, one of the, one of the hardest things, um, I don't want to call, call it a struggle, um, but one of the hardest things to do is to, when you prepare a message and you prepare something the Lord has played on, placed on your heart, what to include and what not to include. <laughs> you know, because I could go probably for three hours, but I know we don't have that much time. So, um, you know, but uh, you, 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 try to, you try to sit down and say, okay, God, what do you want to bring out in this message? So this morning I want to share a message. Or I, would, I would title it this way if we want to give it a title. Uh, the Playground versus Battleground. Playground versus Battleground. Um, the Lord had spoken to me uh, a couple weeks ago, just in my quiet time, and I had journaled it down and wrote it down, and I knew it was going to be something that I, that I preached on and, or, or taught on, at, at least. And um, the Lord said this to me. He says, the church should be on the battleground and not on the playground. Let that sink in. The church should be on the battleground and not on the playground. See, a playground will produce children, but a battleground will produce warriors. I mean, you know, we're called to be soldiers and warriors for Christ. I mean, you know, you've enlisted in an army. Come on. The Bible says in, in Exodus chapter 15, I think it's about the second verse, it says that the Lord is a man of war, the Lord is his name. Come on. He's actually called Jehovah Sava, meaning uh, the Lord of hosts. Actually, when it talks about the Lord of hosts, it's actually talking about a, a, a host that is organized for war. Come on. It's time that, honestly, it's quite honestly a time that the church grows up, steps up, and goes out. Amen. Now, I know this church does that. Amen. But I'm talking, when I say church, I'm, I'm, I'm prefacing this, I'm, I'm talking in general, the church. It's time that the church steps up and grows up. It's time that the church actually gets a backbone and actually speaks the truth. You all right with me speaking the truth this morning? Come on. Because I'm going to tell you what, I don't sugarcoat things. Okay. I'm a man of the word. I preach the word. I don't preach anything else other than the word. If it ain't in the word, you're not going to hear me preaching it. Amen. And and here's the thing. I'm going to tell you this straight up and be real forward with you. I don't care if you get offended because the truth is offensive. Amen. I like how Pastor Marty says, you know, Jesus wasn't nice. He was kind, but he wasn't nice. You know, nice doesn't fashion whips and drive people out of a temple. You know, nice doesn't flip tables over. Nice doesn't call the Pharisees or the religious folk, you brood of vipers, right? You sons of the devil. (laughs) That's not nice. But you know what Jesus was? He was kind. You know, when you look up that word kind, it literally means to be morally excellent. You know, and quite honestly, the truth, I'll just say this, the truth that you're not obedient to will be the truth that's offensive to you. I'll say it again. (laughs) The truth you're not obedient to will be the truth that's offensive to you. 
Right, because when you, here's the thing, truth that you're not obedient to will sound offensive because you're, you're not following it, you're not walking in it, you're not, you're not adhering to the truth. I mean, Jesus gave us, I believe, um, correct me if I'm wrong, but I believe it's over 2,000 commandments in the New Testament alone. I mean, it's, it's, it's a lot. He told us to do these things, do this, heal the sick, cleanse the lepers, feed the, you know, feed the hungry, visit the, visit the, or visit the uh, ones in prison. I mean, he told us all of these things to do, right? And so we have a lot of things to do. I mean, you, you didn't get saved by works. You didn't get saved by doing. But once you're saved, there's some work to do. See, we think we're just going to get saved and sit in a chair. You know, there's no bench warmers in the kingdom. Yeah. No team is going to put up with a, uh, a player who doesn't throw their weight. Yeah. They're not going to put up with somebody that just sits and, well, you know, God bless brother, I'm just going to sit in church. Okay, well, you sitting in church doesn't make you a Christian. Right. Yeah. You, can go, you can go put that chair in a garage and it don't make you a car. Right? It surely ain't going to make you a Christian by sitting here. See, there should be identifying markers. I talked about that this morning. There should be identifying markers that actually prove that you belong to Jesus. One of them, and this is just one of them, but one of them says that they will know that you're my disciples by your love for one another. That's just one, right? Jesus told us that we would know them, we would judge them, we would be able to discern them by their fruits. There should be, see, fruit... I got so many things in my heart this morning, I don't know which way to go. This is, none of this is in my notes, so I'm just, this is all free. Fruit, fruit is not optional. Fruit is not optional. Jesus demands that we grow fruit. Why? Because he tells us in John, uh, John 15, he tells us that every branch that does not bear fruit is taken away. Every branch that does not bear fruit is cut off and it's cast into the fire. Why? Because it's unprofitable. See, increase in the kingdom is not optional. God demands increase. God demands multiplication. Remember when Jesus came and he he told the parable of the kingdom and he gave some of his servants and stewards talents? He gave them, uh, uh, now we would say talents, not in the sense of talents of like, oh, I can do this or look what I can do, but talents in the sense of, you know, uh, I've been given something, I've been given a, a new, that's actually a numerical standard, but I've been given something. He, he refers to the, you know, Jesus refers to the kingdom as a pearl of great price. Right? And so when he talks about giving his servants talents, he's giving us the kingdom. And it says that he gives us that. He tells us, watch this, he tells us, this is in Luke, he tells us to occupy until I come. What does that word mean? That means do business, do trading. What do you do? Watch, oh, you're sick? I have life. Oh, you need healed or you, or you need delivered from demonic? Watch, go in Jesus' name. Oh, you need to be saved? Here, here's the gospel. I'll give it to you, right? And so we have things to trade and to give away. Now watch this. Jesus says this, that when he returns, he will call his servants to him and he will see what they have to offer him. Now remember, the only servants that got rewarded were the one that brought him increase. Remember the first servant? He said, look, Lord, you gave me five and I've gained five more. Right? The second service, you gave me three, and I've gained three more. Watch, the one. Remember the one guy who got the one talent? He says, Lord, I knew you to be a hard man. Sowing, or reaping where you haven't sown, and gathering where you haven't, you know, spread seed. I knew you to be a hard man. He says, so what I did, I took your talent, I took what you gave me, and I wrapped it in a handkerchief, and I hid it. Here it is. You know what Jesus said to him? You wicked and unprofitable servant. He actually, he said, he actually, he said, he said take, what is, take what I gave him and give it to the one who gave me five. Why? Because to him who is given, much is required, right? And so he gives, that, he gives that one to the guy who's five and watch, he says, watch what Jesus says. He says, cast this unprofitable servant into outer darkness. Increase in the kingdom is not optional. See, there is work to do, brothers and sisters. Yes. We cannot, I, I, I'll just be quite honest with you. It's, it's been in my spirit for a long time. There is a sense of urgency. Yeah. The Spirit has spoken to me. There is a sense of urgency in this hour. There is not much time left. Yeah. Beloved, if, if, if the disciples thought they were in the last days, how much more so are we in the last days? Come on. Yeah. Come on. 
And there are things that need to be done. There are people, there are nations, there are tribes that have not yet heard the the name of Jesus. And quite honestly, that's a sin. There are people in our community that need to hear Jesus. In our communities, even in our own nation. Look at our nation right now. They need Jesus. They need the truth. They need to be set free. They need they need people to represent Jesus and go to them to set them free, and that is you. So it's time to get off the playground. It's time to grow up. It's time to step up. See, the problem is in the church today, and again, I use this, I use that word, like I said this morning, I use that word loosely, because we have a lot of churches out there that are nothing more than social clubs. See, the problem with staying on the playground is when you, when you go to a church that has all the bells and whistles, it has the lights, it has the smoke and mirrors, it has all the programs, it has everything that you could desire. Guess what? It has everything but the truth. See, people don't want the truth because the Bible says in the last days people will heap up for themselves teachers who will tickle their ears. We don't need any more sugar preachers. See, what happens when you eat too much sugar? You get disease. We need the truth. Amen. People want to be satisfied with programs and agendas and, and you know, well they, got, oh, well, they have the best children's ministry and they, they got a coffee shop and they got this and they got that. Yeah, they got everything but Jesus in there. Sure. See, the problem is, is most of the church today is conformed more to the world to attract the world than conforming to Jesus to attract people in. Yeah. See, come on. See, the Bible says the Lord added to the church daily those who were being saved. That meant that the church was actually in the community representing Jesus to the people. The problem is, is in the church today, we've created weak Christians that become weak leaders, and then weak leaders create more weak Christians. We need strong leadership, strong leaders that will rise up and train disciples. See, Jesus gave us a mission. See, that's what Brother Curry's doing right now. He's in California. What's he doing? He's imparting, he's imparting teaching into those people so they can rise up and then train disciples themselves. Amen. See, the Bible told us, Jesus tells us this, that our mandate, our mission, and how many know we've got a mandate and we've got a mission? Our mandate and our mission is this, to go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature, amen, making disciples of every nation, teaching them to observe everything that I've commanded you to do, to, commanded you to do, and lo, I will be with you always. Yes. How many know? No go, no low. You might want to write that one down. Everybody wants God to be with them. He says, if you go, I will be with you. See, we want God to be with us, but we don't want to go. I heard, heard a gentleman, he preached the gospel for a lot of years, smoked a lot of Bibles, and he said this, he says, some people say it's, he says, some people say it's dangerous to go. He says, I think it's more dangerous to stay. Yes, amen. Why? Because we will be judged upon what we do. See, people think, oh, well, Pastor Shane, you're, you're, you're too works-based. You're, you're talking too much works. No, the Bible's a lot about works. Jesus said at the end of Revelation, he says, behold, I am coming quickly, and my reward is with me to reward each one according to their work. See, that's what I said. You didn't get saved by works, but once you're saved, there's work to do. And see, this is what we're doing. See, we are not, like I said this morning too, I said this uh, uh, the first service, if you weren't here, we're not here having church. We are here because we are the church. Yeah. See, we got the church, and again, I'm saying this not about this place, I'm just saying in general, the church in general needs to move from having church to being the church. We're not called to have church. We are called to be the church. The church isn't some uh, organization or some you know, foundation. The, the church is a living organism. It is the body of Jesus Christ. You are the hands and feet. You are the mouth of Jesus. When you speak, he speaks. When you lay your hands, he lays his hands. When your feet move, his feet move. Guess what? He's the head. We're the body. If we don't move, he can't move. Everybody's crying out for the next move of God. Well, guess what, brothers and sisters? It's you. You are the next move of God. So the problem is, is we've created weak Christians, and we've, we honestly we have passive Christians. And the reason we have passive Christians, we need aggressive preachers. See, 
Christians should be aggressive. The Bible says that the kingdom, watch this, the kingdom is taken by what? Force. It's violently taken by force. Come on. We need to be violent with the word of God. Not, now, I'm not saying don't go, go and be violent. I'm not, I'm the, let me back off here. You know? Pastor Shane said go out and be violent today. No, 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 no. I'm saying go out and be a violent against the kingdom of darkness. Go out and dis- every time you encounter the kingdom of darkness, destroy it. Why? Because that was Jesus' mandate, to destroy darkness, to destroy the works of the devil. Jesus' mission is your mission. You are to go out and to destroy the works of the devil everywhere you encounter them. 1 Timothy. Let's go to 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 12. We're going to look at some scripture now. First Timothy chapter 6, verse 12, it says, Paul says to his son Timothy, watch what he says. He says, fight the good fight of faith. Lay hold of eternal life to which you were also called and have confessed the good confession in the presence of many witnesses. Notice he says, fight the good fight of faith. How many know this is a good fight to fight? Yeah. Why? Because we win. Yeah. It's a good fight. See, a bad fight's when you don't win. A good fight's when you win, and we win. Why? Because we start at Jesus' victory. See, the problem is, is most of the people in church, most Christians today, are trying to fight for victory. We don't fight for victory. We fight from victory. So we've got a good fight to faith. Now watch this next word. He says, lay hold of eternal life. That means you gotta, you gotta, when you lay hold of something, it's like you grab it by the throat. You lay a hold. I mean, how many of your parents ever, I mean, parents in here, how many of your children ever acted up and you go to lay hold of them? Come on. You lay hold of that child. It's like, hey, come here. <laughs> right? Right? What's the Bible say? It says to lay hold of eternal life. What do you mean? That means become it. Take it. Make it yours. Eternal life. Eternal life is more than you just living forever. Eternal life is you living right now as Jesus would live. It means that you have life and life more abundantly. You walk in power. You walk in authority. You walk in dominion. This is all included in eternal life. Come on. So you lay hold of that thing. Why? You got to fight the good fight of faith. You got to lay hold of the eternal life with which you were also called and have confessed. In other words, you, we did confessions this morning. Praise God. We confess these good confessions in the presence of many witnesses. So we have a good fight to fight. First Peter chapter 5, verse 8. I'm going to go, well, we're going to go kind of fast here. So if you want to write these down, if you can't turn fast enough, well, you can go back and look at them later. But 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 8 says this. It says, be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, walks about like a roaring lion, seeing, seeking whom he may devour. Now watch what, watch, watch what Peter says here. Be sober. What's that mean? Be steady-minded. Be stable. Think one way. Don't be double-minded. Don't, don't be tossed, tossed to and fro by every wind of doctrine. Don't be wishy-washy. You're stable in your thinking. You, don't, you, you, think like the way, you think the way God would think. So be sober. Now watch this. Be vigilant. What's that mean? That's another word for being watchful. Why? we got to always be ready. Never let your guard down. Why? You let your guard down, then the enemy's going to know it, and he's going to attack you there. See, we, here's the thing, church. We have a real adversary, but our adversary is not really strong. See, he's actually super easy to defeat. Why? Because Jesus destroyed him. Jesus defeated him. Jesus, even the Bible, it says that he paralyzed him. Amen. Amen. He disarmed him. I get the, I, I, I think in pictures and I think of the devil running around with no arms, right? He disarmed him. You know, think about you fighting a guy that's got no arms. That's going to be a pretty easy fight to win, Right? And so you're just going to be able to pop him in the face all day long. And he might be able to kick you once in a while, but he can't do a whole lot. Right? That's the enemy we face. That's why Jesus said, you're going to do greater works than I do. See, Jesus told us that in John. He says, you're going to do the same works that I do, but greater works will you do. Why? Because I go to the Father. 
It's actually, Jesus said this, it's actually beneficial that I go be with the Father. Why? Because if I don't, I can't send another like me, the helper, the Holy Spirit, the, watch, the Spirit of the living God, the Spirit of the Son that allows us to cry out, Abba, out, Abba, Father. He says, if I don't go, I can't send that Spirit. And how many of you know, he went and now he has sent that Spirit. It's called the Spirit of his Son into our hearts uh, and now allowing us to cry out, Abba, Father. How many, Jesus said he would send one just like him. He didn't send a, a spirit that was less than him. See, people say, I've heard Christians say, well, you know, the disciples, you know, they just, they had Jesus. They could touch him. They could spend time with him. They could hear him. They could, you know, watch him. And I'm like, um, newsflash, you have the Holy Spirit the one that's just like him, living on the inside of you, you can spend time with him. He is just like Jesus. And because he's just like Jesus, that makes you just like Jesus. Because the Bible says, as he is, so are we in this world. Watch that, in this world. Not in the world to come, right now in this world. Amen? And so he tells us, Peter tells us here to be sober, be vigilant, he says, watch, because your adversary, so you've got to realize you have an adversary. You've got somebody out that's trying to destroy you, trying to kill you, trying to steal from you. John 10.10, 10, the enemy comes to what? Steal, kill, and destroy. Steal, kill, and destroy. So here, watch, we've got a real enemy, right? And he, watch this, he walks about, he's the devil, right? He walks about like a roaring lion. Now let's not mistake it, he is not a roaring lion. Come on. We serve the lion of the tribe of Judah. We have a roaring lion on our side, but he is not a roaring lion. He is like, what's he doing? He's trying to imitate Jesus. See, everything that the kingdom of God does, the enemy tries to mimic. All right? And so we have this adversary. He walks about like a roaring lion. So don't be afraid of him because he's not a roaring lion. You know, the Bible says this, that one day when, when the enemy is revealed, we're all going to stand around and look at him and go, that's who we were afraid of? That's, what? That little thing? We, we, we were so fearful of that, right? See, if you get that now, you'll never fear him. We need to live with no fear. Fear does not belong in the church. See, because the, the opposite of fear is faith, and the opposite of faith is fear. So we've got to walk in faith, amen? And so he says here, your adversary, the devil, walks around like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. Watch this in verse 9. Resist him. Well, how do we resist him? He gives us the answer. Steadfast in the faith. That's how you resist him. You resist him steadfast in the faith. Steadfast meaning you're unmovable. You're unshakable. You don't move. You don't, you don't back down. You stand, watch this, you stand in the face of the enemy and you look him right in the eyes. Why? Because you win. See, we need Christians that will actually, like I said earlier, that will grow a backbone and will actually be able to stand up in the face of the enemy and knock back, not back down because watch, he's going to make himself look, be, to be looking bad and big and strong, and, but he's not. See, the only thing the enemy really can do is make you quit. If he can bring, watch, because quite honestly, I mean, yes, he will bring major blows to us once in a while, but it's usually the small little things, right? And he'll just little blow after blow after blow, after, what, try to wear you down, right? So the Bible gives us the answer, resist him, resist him. The Greek word, it's actually interesting, the Greek word there for resist him, or that word resist, is antihistamine. The Greek word is antihistamine. Now, we get our English word is antihistamine. It's where, it's, it's the, uh, you know, it's what, I guess, Benadryl, the drug Benadryl does, right? It's an antihistamine. It actually stands against histamine, not allowing histamine to, you know, to activate in your system. The, so here is a prescription right in the Word of God that tells us how to resist the devil. You antihistamine him by what? Stead, standing steadfast in the faith. Unmovable, unshakable, right? Watch this. So you resist him, steadfast in the faith, knowing that the same sufferings are experienced by your brotherhood in the world. So what's that mean? It's okay if you're walking through trouble. 
Jesus said you would have troubles. He said, in this world, you will have tribulation, but be of good cheer. I've overcome the world. Jesus is saying, if I've I've overcome it, you've overcome it. See, now I want to preface this too. Tribulations is not sickness and disease. People say, oh, well, God, you know, I got troubles in my life. I got sickness and disease, but it's okay. Jesus had it too. No, Jesus never had sickness and disease. Jesus suffered things, but it was never sickness and disease. Come on. All right? So we, now watch. Now, there's sufferings, because, I mean, we are to fellowship with Jesus in his sufferings, right? We're to conform with him in his death. So, I mean, there is the baptism of sufferings. If you suffer for Jesus, that's okay. He did too. Fellowship in that. So, again, resisting the devil, steadfast in the faith. Now, watch this. In verse, uh, yeah, let's go to 1 Corinthians uh, 16, 13. 1 Corinthians 16, 13. This verse says this, watch, stand fast in the faith, be brave, be strong. Now read that verse one more time. Watch, stand fast in the faith, be brave, be strong. Now it's, some interesting, it's an interesting scripture. That word watch there in the Greek, the definition that that word, that word gives us in the Greek is to, to give strict attention to. That means, you know what that means? That means you're laser focused. That means you, you drive out every other distraction. Come on. I mean, there's a lot of distractions out there. There's a lot of things that are trying to get your attention. You know, just, well, I do have it on me. These things right here. This is a distraction. Facebook is a distraction. YouTube is a distraction. Now, am I saying we can't use those things for, for the kingdom and for good? I'm not saying we can't do that, but most times people... Okay, let me ask you this question. When's the last time this paid your bill? <laughs> When's the last time this healed you? Come on, right? Why do you spend so much time with it then? Mm-hmm. See what I'm saying? See, there are distractions that we need to get rid of in our lives. I think David Wilkerson used to say this. He said, you know, he says, you know, which, you know, which, uh, which houses belong to the devil. He says, just look for the horns on top of the roof. It was the TV antennas. That's what he used to say, right? Now, now here's the thing. The devil's gotten sneaky. He don't need ten, ten, antennas anymore. Now he can pipe it into your house and he can even do it without wires. Right? There's many distractions out there. See, what you put your focus on, you will become. See, this is what, when, when, when Paul says this here in, in, uh, um, in verse 13, when he says watch, he's saying, you pay attention. Jesus said, listen, take heed to what you hear. Why? Because, why? Because you've got ear gates, you've got eye gates, right? What you allow in is what's going to come out of you. Why? Because out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. Yes. What you allow in affects you. So be watchful of what you watch. Be watchful of what you hear. Be watchful of what you read. Watch. Stay focused. But honestly, get consumed with this. Because if you're not consumed with this, then you're consumed with something else. You've got you've to be so consumed with this word that it's what you become. You live, breathe, breathe, eat it. You, I mean, it's, it's what you think about. It's what you meditate on. It's what you study. It's what you, it's what you do. Because I mean, we can't just be hearers of the word. We've got to be doers. Yeah. So we've got to watch. Right. Stand, well, watch this. He said watch, but he also says stand fast in the faith. Again, that kind of talks about being steadfast in the faith when we resist them. Another one, stand fast in the faith. What do you do? That means you're unmovable. That means you're not backing down. I mean, you know what that means? See, when, when children get off the playground and they get on the battleground, it's going to require grit. Do you hear me this morning? Yeah. It's going to require grit. That means you're going to have to get on the battleground and you're going to have to stay, stay steadfast. Now, here's the thing I want to tell you. It's like, you know, should we be worried about the enemy? Not really, but yes. I mean, here, well, no, you shouldn't be worried about the enemy. But here's the thing. The enemy isn't going to take it laying down. You know what I'm saying? If, if you, okay, if you're in the trenches 
and you're firing at the enemy, the enemy's going to fire back. But here's the thing you have to understand. We have protection. Yes. Well, we're going to get to that in a minute. We're going to look at some scriptures. We have protection. But here's the thing. We've got to get on the battleground. We've got to get off the playground. See, the playground produces children. The playground produces baby. But the battleground requires you to stand fast. It requires you to dig in. It requires you to always be moving forward. Now watch this next word. He says, be brave. Watch. You can't run around in fear and be brave. You can't be worried about tomorrow. Jesus said, take no thought for tomorrow. See, tomorrow's got enough issues of its own, and today's got enough issues of its own. Tomorrow will have its own worries, its own cares, its own things, right? Just, just take care of today. So don't, if no thought to tomorrow, so what do you do? You be brave. That word be brave in the, uh, in the Greek, it's interesting. It says to act manly. You ladies, <laughs> start acting manly. <laughs> no, it, says, it says act manly, watch. Act manly with wisdom and courage. See, sons of God walk in courage. Yes. They don't walk in fear. They're not worried about what the devil may do, what he might do, where he might be coming from. Uh, he, they don't worry about tomorrow. They're not worried about their paycheck. They're not worried about their bills. They're not worried about, you know, what, what's God going to do if, you know, there's not enough food tomorrow. They're not worried about any of that. Why? They don't live in fear. They're brave. They walk in courage. Now watch, they walk in wisdom. I'd say, people say, I fear people say, you know, well, you know, brother, we got to use wisdom. Next, you know, my next question to people that say that is, what wisdom? No. Oh, you know, we got to use wisdom. I, I, you know, yeah, let's go back to 2020 when things went downhill, right? People say, well, brother, you got to use wisdom. My, would, my, my next question would be, what wisdom? Because there's the wisdom of man, and then there's the wisdom of God. Right. And the wisdom of God is completely different than the wisdom of man. The wisdom of God doesn't say, mask up, protect yourself, run around, you know, try, to get, you know, uh, try to get enough food, buy enough toilet paper. That's not the wisdom of God. See, the wisdom, yeah, the wisdom, that's the wisdom of man. The wisdom of God says, my Father takes care of every one of my needs. So therefore, I can be brave. I can be strong. I can be courageous. Therefore, I can stand steadfast right in the face of the devil and not back down. Why? Because he's got my six. See, see God's always got your back. That's why you never got to look back. And you're never called to go back. You're always called to move forward. He says, be brave. Now watch this last one. Be strong. I mean, God wants you strong. He's like, oh, not me. You know, I want to be weak. No, no, he wants you strong. Right? He, he, he tells it over and over and over again in his word. He talks about being strong, being steadfast in the faith, standing in the face of the devil, being strong, being strengthened in him. All this stuff about being strong. God wants us to be strong. So what's this mean? If we're to watch, if we're to stand fast in the faith, if we're to be brave, if we're to be strong, what do we do? There's no sleeping, there's no laziness, and there's no slacking. See, on the playground, there's laziness, there's sleeping, and there's slacking. See, when you're on the playground, you're not, you're not concerned about what the devil, well, you are concerned, I mean, in the sense of you're not, uh, you're, not, you're, not, you're not watchful, you're not vigilant, you're not paying attention. When you're on the playground, you're just a child and the, and the enemy can eat your lunch every day. See, when you're on the battleground, you become a soldier. It causes you to rise up. It causes you to, it causes you to arm up. It causes you to suit up. It causes you to stand strong, stand tall. It causes you to stand with pride. Why? Because you serve your father, God, and you're in his military. Yeah. So no sleeping, no laziness, no slacking. What's that mean? Laser focus, act of faith, and always moving forward. Yeah. See, this is what sons of God should be doing. They should have laser focus on the things of God. The things of God should be what we desire. The things of God should be what we're going after. Making sure people are being set free, healed, saved, delivered, fed, clothed. I mean, these are the things that we are told and commanded to do. We should have laser focus upon his word, and we should have laser focus upon fulfilling his word. Amen? Amen. Second Timothy chapter 2, verse 1. Paul says to Timothy, he says, You, ther you therefore, my son, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. Again, what does he say? Be strong. Again, Christians, sons of God, should be strong. He says, now watch this. He says, be strong in the grace. I mean, you know, everything we now do is by grace. 
Talk about that for a minute, because I feel like the Holy Spirit needs to bring that out. We don't do things by work. We don't do things by our own power. Everything we do is by the grace of God. Now, there's a couple meanings to grace. It's interesting where we study the word grace. It's the Greek word charis, which literally means unmerited favor from God, right? But it's, it, there's a really neat definition within the Thayer's. Thayer's is kind of like taking a magnifying glass and looking at the Strong's and getting a deeper understanding. The Thayer's would say this, that grace is the divine inspiration of God upon the heart with the outward reflection of God in the life. I'll say that one more time if you're writing that down, if you want to get that. Grace is the divine inspiration of God upon my heart with the outward reflection. In other words, people should see God in us. The outward reflection of God in my life. That's grace. So Paul tells his spiritual son, Timothy, be strong in the grace. What's that mean? Understand what grace has done for you. It's by grace you can lay your hands on the sick and watch them be healed. It's by grace you can give a word and a demon leaves. It's by grace you can break bread and multiply and feed plenty when you know you didn't have enough to start, but you ended up with enough. Amen. I've seen that happen. Amen. Why? That's by grace. See, it's not by your works. It's by grace. Why? Because if it's by what you do, you can boast. But if you're strong in the... See, if you're strong in works, it'll let you down. But if you're strong in grace, grace always delivers. So be strong in the grace, watch what he says here, that is in Christ Jesus. How many of you know where, where is Christ now? Come on. It's Christ in you, the hope of glory. Verse 2, he says, And these things that you have heard from me among many witnesses, commit these to faithful men, who will be able to teach others also. What's he saying? These things you've heard about being strong in the grace, about staying steadfast in the faith, about you know, having laser focus, active faith, no slacking, always moving forward. He says, watch this. He says, commit these teachings to faithful men. See, Paul says that we need to know those who we labor among. We need to know them who we, who we, who we work with, right? And we're to commit these teachings to faithful men. Jesus even said himself, do not throw your pearls to the swine. What does he mean by that? Don't give the kingdom to people who don't care about it. Right? You teach men, now watch, you commit these things to faithful men who will be able to teach others also. Remember I said weak Christians produce weak leaders who produce more weak Christians? That's why you commit these things to faithful men who will raise up disciples, who will teach others to walk in the power and the might and the authority of the Lord. See, this is what's happening within the life teams. Life teams are raising up leaders See, you're leading a life team, you're pastoring in that life team, but then you're also raising up other leaders who will then eventually go start more life teams, who will raise up other leaders, who eventually will go start more life teams, who will raise up other leaders. And you see, it's like that, it's like that wash or that, yeah, wash, rinse, repeat thing, right? We, we are making disciples that make disciples that make disciples that make disciples. We are raising leaders that raise leaders that raise leaders that raise leaders. And every one of you, I'm going to say this right now. Every one of you should have at least two disciples, if not more. Our commandment was not to go on into all the world and make converts. Our commandment was to go into all the world and make what? Disciples. disciples. If you're not making disciples, then you're not fulfilling the Great Commission. See, it's not called the Great Suggestion. It's called the Great Commission. There's no options. There's no other options. You know, somebody asked me one time, you know, um, well, we actually just talked about it, uh, we actually just talked about it yesterday in the car, you know, we talked about, you know, Leah and my daughter, and she's 13, and, you know, and we said, you know, are you, you know, Katie, actually, are you going to go to college? And she's like, well, no, I don't think so. You know, she goes, there's nothing really else to do than preach the gospel. See, that's why I'm raising my, ch my, my child, I'm raising my child to, to teach her that there's nothing else in this world to do than preach the gospel. And quite honestly, if she wants to go do something else, she'll pay for it. Because I'm going to raise her in the ways of the Lord. I'm going to teach her what's important in life. Because here's the reality. If we would all get a hold of this and we would, all, we would all preach the gospel and we would all make disciples, we'd get this thing wrapped up a lot quicker. But yet we think that, oh, well, you know, that, that discipling thing or that mentoring thing or that leadership thing, it's just for the super elite Christians. It's just for the special people. No, it's for each and every one of us. You are in the army of the Lord. He says here, 
He says, and these things you've heard from me among many witnesses, commit these things to faithful men who will be able to teach others also. What are you teaching them? You're teaching them how to fight and be strong. You therefore, verse three, you therefore must endure hardship as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. Do you notice that? No, most people don't like that scripture. Mm-hmm. What does James say? Count it all joy, brethren, yeah. when you fall, fall into various trials and tribulations. Why? Because these things produce things within you. They produce character. They produce peace. They produce joy. They produce hope. They produce things within you. It's okay when you walk through trials. It's okay when you walk through troubles. Why? It's, why? Because it's going to happen, and it produces amazing things in us. Now watch this. He says, you therefore at must endure hardship as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. Verse four, no one, everybody say no one. No No one engaged in warfare entangles himself with the affairs of life. See, the playground becomes an entanglement. You get entangled in the swings and, uh, and uh, the other playground equipment. You get, what happens is that when you get on the playground, you get appeased and pleased by the things around you. Well, I'm just content just sitting here. I'm just content swinging on this swing. I'm just content coming to church. My job is to make you uncontent. My job is to destroy every rock you hide behind. Why? Because if I can destroy every rock you hide behind, you have no excuses. Quiet in here. See, there, should, there are no excuses as to why you can't fulfill the Great Commission. I've heard people, even in my own church, say, well, that's just not my calling. Then what is your calling? Because I don't see any other calling in the Word of God. Well, you know, I'll, 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 you know, I'll do this, I'll lead worship, you know, but uh, you know, I just, you know, street ministry and outreach, that's just not my thing. Then what is your thing? Guys are quiet. Amen. What is your thing then? Why? Because there is no other thing than to, than to go out and preach the gospel and heal the sick, cast out demons, raise the dead, cleanse the leper. What is your thing then? See, you have to understand, beloved, there's no workshops in heaven. When you get to heaven, there's not going to be anything to do up there other than worship him and just be in peace and joy all the time. There's no workshop. You're not going to give a list of to-do things in heaven. I said this too at at my church a couple weeks ago. I said, you know what? In the kingdom, there's no job fairs. You know, you ever been to a job fair and you get to walk around and look at this table, look at this business and look at the, oh, look what they got to offer. Oh, look what they got to, oh man. Oh, the benefits are good there. And you you don't get to choose what you want to do in the kingdom. You're given a mandate. You're given a mission. You're told to go into all the world and preach the gospel. You're told, you're commanded to do these things. And if you don't, quite honestly, you're being disobedient. So no one, watch what this says, verse 4, no one engaged in warfare entangles himself, watch this, in the affairs of life. And quite honestly, Jesus will not share his kingdom with your entanglements. He won't. He needs you free from this world. Paul says, I'm dead to the world and the world dead to me. See, we've got to live that way. Where the nothing, I don't desire anything in the world. No, I love the world in the sense of I want to you know, Jesus gave because he, you know, or John 3, 16, for, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. Now we need to love the world in the sense of love the people, try to rescue the people, try to get people out of the world and into the kingdom. But I don't love the things that the world loves. I'm not going to be entangled with the things that the world is entangled with. I'm not going to be tied down. I'm not going to be weighted down. I'm going to let loose those things so I can run the race and finish well. See, the problem is, is we get ourselves so weighted down with things. You show me your bank account, and I'll, you show me your bank account, and I'll show you where your priorities are. Right? Well, you know, my children, they got, they got soccer games. They got basketball games. They got this game. They got this. They got to go to this. They got to go karate. They got to, you know, okay. Are you raising them in the ways of the Lord, or are you teaching them to love the things the world loves? We'll get them involved in so many things where our priorities get so out of line, it will be chasing after everything the world chases after and we'll end up looking no different than the world looks. And yet we want to say, oh, we're Christians. What makes you a Christian? I told you I was going to preach truth this morning. You all good with this, right? 
I, I mean, I don't really care. If you're not good with it, that's okay too. You know, I'm not going to change my message. I'm not going to water it down. If you don't like it, sorry. Sorry, but not sorry. <laughs> now watch this. So you, you are not to be entangled with the affairs of this life. That Watch this. Now, so no soldier, now let me read this back up. No one engaged in warfare entangles himself with the affairs of this life that he may please him who enlisted him as a soldier. You are enlisted in the army of God. Yes. How many know there is no army that's going to put up with a soldier who doesn't fight? Yeah. Guess what? You're going to be uh, dishonorably discharged. The Lord is a man of war. Yes. The Lord is our general. Yes. And we fight for the kingdom. Amen. There's no other option. You've been enlisted. Now watch this. Our job is to please him. How I many of the Bible says in Hebrews chapter 11, verse 6, without faith, it's impossible to please God. What are we fighting? We're fighting the good fight of faith. We're fighting that good fight of faith. Listen, verse 5. And also, if anyone competes in athletics or um, masteries, I think the King James says, he is not crowned unless he competes according to the rules. Now, that word, it's interesting, that Greek word for athletics there, uh, actually, it means war or sport. See, we think athletics and we think it's for sport, but actually, that word actually does lend the condemnation or the, the idea that it actually means war, right? So, if you're going to compete in war, right, because how I many know, even though it's a war, there's competition. Why? Because one's going to be the loser and one's going to be the winner, yes. right? And so, if you're going to compete in war, whether it's war or sport, you're not crowned or you don't have victory unless you compete according to the rules. Well, quite honestly, we have our rules of engagement. It's right here. Yes. People say, well, I need to hear from God. It's right here. I need a special leading. It's right here. <laughs> you don't need, your leading is in the word of God. Your leading is right here in this word. You don't need a special leading. You don't need a rhema word. You've got a word right here. Everybody wants to go to the next conference, the next prophet. Oh, I need to get the word. I need to get a new word. I need to get a new word. How about you read the words you've been given? There are so many promises and words in here, but yet people will leave this thing on their table, they won't open it, and then they wonder why they're starving. This is good. I know it is. Because <laughs> it's the Word of God. Now watch this. To be crowned, you've got to get in the game. Did you hear that? Yes. To be crowned, to be crowned victor, to win the war, to win the battle, you've got to get in the game. You can't win sitting there. There are no, but nobody that's a bench warmer receives a trophy. I was the ultimate bench warmer. <laughs> I was the ultimate pew sitter. I was the ultimate chair sitter. No. <laughs> the ones that are going to be rewarded are going to be rewarded based off of what they did for the Lord. Yes, amen. Finally, brethren, Ephesians chapter 6. Ephesians chapter 6, verse 10, Paul says this, Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord yes. and in the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. Yes. Now watch this. You're not wearing the armor God gave you. You're wearing God's armor. It's not some other mediocre half-powered armor, you have the armor of God. And how many know God's armor never gets any chinks in it? It never gets any arrows in it. No sword can thrust through it. Amen. Come on. put on. Now watch what he says. Put on the armor of the Lord. Put on the armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against rulers of the darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in heavenly places. Yeah. Now, it's interesting. Watch what he says. We don't wrestle against flesh and blood, all right? So we don't wrestle against people. We're not wrestling against one another. Yeah. We're wrestling, but here's the thing. We do wrestle. We do fight. 
We do war, but we do war against people. We war against principalities. We war against powers. We, rule against, we, we war or fight against rulers of darkness of this age. We wrestle or war against spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places. Now, this is an interesting word, this word wrestle. This word wrestle in the Greek. Listen to this definition. It's a contest between two. How many know there is a contest between two right now? There is a contest between uh, the kingdom of light and the kingdom of darkness, the kingdom of God and the kingdom of the devil, right? And so there is a contest, watch, a contest between two in which each endeavors to throw the other and which is decided when the victor is able to hold his opponent down with his hand upon his neck. That's good. This is the wrestling that we're called to do. Watch this. I'll read this one more time. A contest between two in which each endeavors to throw the other and which is decided when the victor is able to hold his opponent down with his hand upon his neck. See, that's where we got the enemy. Yeah. We got our hand should be upon his neck. Yeah. He should be on the ground and he should be under our feet. Therefore, because of this, verse 13, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day. And having done all to stand, stand therefore. Now watch, you see the language he uses here. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God. And actually in the weast, in the, in the Greek there, it would actually lend the idea of uh, once and for all. And actually the Greek actually says once and for all, take up the armor. In other words, don't put off your armor. Don't take off your armor. You know, people say, well, I got up this morning and I put on the armor of God before I went out. Why'd you take it off? <laughs> if God doesn't slumber, I know the enemy doesn't. Come on. Don't take off your armor. Put it on once and for all. Leave it on. Why? That you may be able to withstand in the evil day. Yeah. And having done all, to stand. You see, the, you see the wording he's using there? Stand. 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 What do you do? You stand. You don't sit. You stand. You, you don't fight a war from sitting down. You don't wrestle somebody from your pew, from your chair, from your seat. You wrestle by standing up and getting involved in the battle. Yes. So what do you do? You stand, therefore, having girded your waist with truth. Why? Because if your waist ain't gird, isn't girded with truth, you'll never be able to stand. See, the truth is what sets you free, Amen. even if the truth hurts. The truth is what holds it all together. Without the truth, you're going to be caught with your pants around your ankles. Yes, amen. See, it's the belt of truth. It holds everything together. It was actually, it's interesting that Paul uses these armor pieces to describe the armor of God. You know, when he was writing this, he was in a Roman cell. And he's seeing Roman soldiers every day, every day wearing Roman armor, right? And he sees, watch, that the, according to Roman armor... The, the loin belt or the, the, the belt of truth that he talks about here was the, um, it, was, it wasn't the most fanciest piece. It was actually the most plain piece of armor, but yet it was the most important piece of armor. Why? Because the pants attached to the belt and even the, the breastplate that they wore attached to that belt. It held everything together because without that belt, he would be loose and the armor wouldn't be tight against him protecting him. See, truth, the truth of God holds everything together so you can be protected, right? Without truth, you're, you're exposed to the enemy, okay? So what do you do? You gird your waist with the truth. Now watch this next part. Having put on the breastplate of righteousness. Now the breastplate of righteousness, it's interesting. It was actually made of precious metals. And what they would do is as the, the more the breastplate was used in battle, the shinier it would become. Why? Because there's pieces of ornate metal. There's, there's, there's a, um, they actually made them in little tiny pieces that all kind of came together, and they were flexible, and they moved, but yet they protected the chest and back of the soldier, right? But the more they used them, the more they rubbed together, and guess what? The shinier it got. Yeah. See, when you walk in righteousness, you're not walking in your righteousness. You're not walking in Jesus' righteousness. You're walking in God's righteousness by what Jesus Christ did. Amen. You are, watch, Jesus says, I am the light of the world, and he turns to you and says, you are the light of the world. The more you walk in righteousness, the more it shines, right? And the, more, and the brighter people see, or the brighter, the more light people see. Now watch this. 
So having put on the breastplate of righteousness, now watch this next part. Having shod your feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Now watch this. It's interesting. The Romans would have wore shoes that actually would have had spikes on the bottom of them. They were actually, they were actually called killer shoes. They were used in battle, and, and they would be taken. They were actually used, number one, to get, to get a good grip and a stance. So they were kind of like cleats. They were steel cleats. But they were also used in battle that if you needed to on somebody, it did some damage. Now, what's this say? Watch what Romans chapter 16, verse 20 says. And the God of peace shall crush Satan under your feet shortly. Come on, church. See, we, we need to shod our feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Why? Because it crushes Satan everywhere we go. Now watch this, next part. Above all, verse 16. Above all, taking the shield of faith with which you will be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked one. Now this is interesting. Where it says above all, it actually doesn't mean like this is the most important piece of armor. The Greek would actually lend the idea that this is above all means out in front of. Right? Why? Because your shield is never meant to be thrown over your shoulder. Your shield is always out in front of all. So that's why when it says above all, it actually talks in the Greek about position. So it's not about, it's about where the position of the shield is. So the shield should be out in front of you at all times, right? Now watch what it says. So it would actually read this way in the Greek, uh, out in front of you, taking the shield of faith with which you'll be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked one. I mean, it doesn't quench some of the fiery darts. It quenches all of them. Yes. The Roman soldiers, this is interesting when you study this stuff out, the Roman soldiers would have took, taken this shield. This shield was, it was, it was wooden on the inside, but then it was wrapped in several layers of animal hide. Um, some say, um, some scholars and stuff will say it was actually wrapped in the six to seven, maybe even eight layers of animal hide. Now that animal hide was... Was, was supple in the sense of it could bend, it could move, it, it, would, it would take blows, it would, it would allow arrows to penetrate but not go through. But they, what the soldiers would do, and that was interesting, they had to take care of their shield. Why? Because if they didn't take care of their shield, their shield would let them down in battle. See, it's the shield of faith, and you need to take care of it. Yeah. See, they would actually take, and it's interesting, the, the soldiers would take oil, and they would actually rub oil into that hide, that leather hide, right? And they would work the oil into the, into the hide, into that shield. Why? So that the shield would stay supple and soft because if it didn't, it would get brittle and next time it took a blow from a sword, it would crack and break. Well, what's an oil representation of? The Holy Spirit. Right? You work your, the Holy Spirit works into your faith and you work the faith by the Holy Spirit. Right? And then here's the other thing to do. If they knew, now watch this. This is interesting. This is really cool. If the soldiers knew that they were going to battle in the morning, you know what they would do with that shield? They would soak it in water. Why? Because tomorrow morning when they go to battle and fiery darts are shot at them, it would take every one of them and it would quench them right away. Well, what's water representation of? The Word. What do you do? You soak your faith in the Word of God. So it'll quench every fiery dart of the wicked one. Come on, isn't this good? Now watch, so this is where your position, now watch. Now here's the other neat thing about the shield of faith. The shield of faith was actually a very, it actually was a very, oh, the shield of faith, the, the shield that the Roman soldiers used was actually a very large shield. It was actually ob, oblong and door-shaped. It actually covered almost the whole soldier, his, his whole, he couldn't, even, he couldn't even see past it, right? And I got to thinking about this. This is really cool. I got to think about this. If he can't see past his shield, right, and it's out in front of him, How's he to see? Well, you know what the Lord said? We don't walk by sight. We walk by faith. I don't need to see what's in front of me. I don't need to see what's going on around me. All I know is this is what I believe and this is what I shall have. Come on. How many know you will have what you believe for? And your faith, should, your faith will deliver every time. Why? Because faith works. Faith doesn't sit. Faith works. Come on. Now watch, so this, 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 we walk by faith and not by sight. Our shield is out in front of us. Now watch this next part. He says here, and take the helmet of salvation. This is good. 
The helmet on the Roman soldier was the most ornate piece of his armor. It was very decorated. It was very colorful. A lot of them would either have the red uh, horse hair or some of them would actually have horse hair that would come up off and drape down the back of the soldier. Each, each one was a little bit different. Um, they all pretty much had a standard look, but I mean, they were different colors, different designs, different thing, ornate pieces. And it was probably one of the most artistic piece of the whole armor. Well, isn't it interesting that our salvation would be the most beautiful piece of the whole armor? And how many know, watch, watch, he is to put the, watch, the helmet of salvation on. What's it do? It protects your mind. See, the Lord has given you something to protect your mind, and it's salvation, right? It protects you from the enemy. Because how many know, the enemy, the number one battleground for the enemy is what? Why? Because if he can get in your mind, again, he's going to eat your lunch every day. That's why you've got to renew your mind according to the word of God, right? Don't be conformed to the world, but be re- transformed by the renewing of your mind. So in other words, you got to change the way you think. Because if you change the way you think, you'll change the way you act, you'll change the way you talk, and you'll even change the course of your life. Yes. And when the enemy comes along and tries to speak to you, you go, oh, nope, that's not a God thought. Yeah. And then you, go, then you go to 2 Corinthians chapter 10, you say, oh, I take every thought captive. So then you begin to take every thought captive that doesn't line up with the word of God, and you begin to cast those things down. Yeah. Why? Because if you allow them to become imaginations, imaginations become manifestations. Yeah. So we've got to be careful what we imagine. Be careful what you meditate on. So watch this. He's given us the, the uh, helmet of salvation. Now watch this next part. And the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. Now this is a really cool one. The sword of the Spirit. The word sword there in the Greek is the word makira. Makira was actually a Greek sword, or a Roman, or sorry, a Roman sword. Uh, it was, it was, a, it was, it wasn't, now we think of the sword of the spirit. We want to think, you know, the word of God is sharper than any double-edged sword. We want to think, okay, that's what we think about, right? We think about this major sword that I'm swinging back and forth, right? A Makira wasn't a major, huge, big, long sword. It was actually a small dagger. It was actually, and a lot of them were curved, right? And they were used, now watch this, they were used for close combat. They weren't used for combat at a distance. It was when when the enemy was up in your face and it was almost a hand-to-hand combat kind of activity, you would take your makira and you would stab your opponent in the side. It's the word of God that he's given us. It's our makira. It's the sword of the spirit. It is what Jesus did when he was tempted of the devil. What did he fight the devil with? It is written. What do you do? And see, here's the neat thing about the makira. Now, I don't want to get kind of gruesome if there's any children here, but they would take that makira. that, That word makira... They said it was actually, it would strike fear into the hearer, of the, or into the hearer when they said they were going to use a Makira, right? Because what it, what it would do, it would actually would go into the, that person, and it would actually, when it was pulled back out, yeah. things would come out with it. So what do we do? We take the word of God, and we gut the enemy with it. Why? Because you, here's where you fight them with. It is written. Yeah. It is written. Why? By his stripes, I am healed. It is written that as he is, so am I in this world. Get some it is written and start fighting the enemy with it is written. Let me tell you, you throw some it is written at him, he'll stop coming around. Yeah. He, don't like the, he don't like the word of God, and especially he don't like it when, he, when you know how to use the word of God. Yeah. Amen? So watch this. He continues on. We're going to wrap up here because I'm running out of time. He says here, actually, I am out of time, I think, but that's okay. We're almost done. So watch this. He says here, Take the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God, praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit, being watchful. Wow, there's that word again, watchful. Always watching, laser focus, attention given to the things of God, to the Word of God. Being watchful to this end with all perseverance and supplication for all the saints. Now notice, see, here's the thing. The armor also includes praying. See, we like to stop and just stop at the sword of the Spirit. But the armor says, watch this, praying always with all prayer. I mean, there's more than just one type of prayer. You can pray pray in your natural language. You can pray in heavenly language. You can pray with your maintenance tongues. You can pray with your warfare tongues, right? There's multiple avenues of praying. There's multiple ways of praying, right? So we need to watch it. We need to pray with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit right? This is part of the armor, right? Watch. Being watchful to this end with all perseverance. What's that mean? Be diligent about praying. Paul said, I pray in tongues more than you all, right? Now, people say, well, how much did he pray in tongues? I don't know, but let's just get a a jump on him, right? Let's start praying in tongues and see if we can beat him, 
right? Because honestly, when you pray in tongues, when you pray in, when you pray in the Spirit, it'll, it, what it does is you're, you become sensitive to the Spirit. I like to call it your, uh, your Holy Ghost vitamins. It's like taking your Holy Ghost vitamins for the day. You pray in the Spirit, and you say, how much should I be praying? I, I would say at least 30 minutes a day, at least. Notice I say at least. Honestly, you should be praying in the Spirit a lot, right? Because the more you pray in the Spirit, the, the more power, the more stuff you're going to see. It's, it's just quite honestly, it works out that way. And, and I don't mean to sound weird, but it's almost like you put up your radar. You know, and it's like you got the Holy Spirit radar up, right? And it's just like you're seeing, you're seeing missiles coming in. You're seeing darts coming in. You're able to avoid them. Why? Because you're always in the Spirit. Hallelujah. Now watch this. And for me, verse 19, so Paul says, now he's saying, pray for me. Now watch, he's telling his, uh, the, 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 the church of Ephesus, he says, and pray for me, watch, that the utterance may be given to me, that utterance may be given to me, that I may open my mouth boldly to make known the mystery of the gospel, for which I am an ambassador in chains, that in it I may speak boldly as I ought to speak. Beloved, we need to speak boldly. We need to speak with authority. We need to speak with power. We've got to realize, I said this morning in our first service, but we've got to realize that our words hold weight. Yeah. Our words have power. When we speak, things change. When we speak, things shift. We've got to speak what God would speak. We've got to boldly, watch this, we've got to boldly proclaim the word of the Lord. Yes. The righteous are as bold as lions. Amen. The Lord said this, to me, said this to me the other day. We actually, actually, we were at a, we, we do a thing called Pow Lunch where we feed, we go, our life team goes, and we, uh, I think we cooked like 140 meals, 140 lunches um, for anybody. Anybody in our community can come in and get a hot lunch, and it's just an amazing outreach opportunity, but uh, we had our youth group was there, and uh, they were helping, some of our youth are homeschooled, so they were able to come and help make lunch and all this, and, and so after we make lunch for people, we get to go out and minister to people. And so some, we told our youth, because they like to go minister to people, so our youth go minister to some of them. So they started going out, but then they turned around and they came back. And our youth pastor, Katie, she said, you know, uh, uh, nobody's chickens. There's no chickens here. And I, I was like, wow, that's really good. And I was sitting there, I was sitting there dipping out. We made meatballs uh, that day. I was sitting there dipping out meatballs, and the Lord began to speak to me. He says, yeah. He says, the church isn't a hen house raising chickens. It's a pride that's raising lions. Do you hear that? Yes. The church is not a hen house raising chickens. It is a pride that's raising lions. Amen. The righteous are bold. The righteous stand up. The righteous are strong. The righteous take their position. Sons take their position, and they don't back down from the enemy. Why? Because we win. Amen? Amen. Amen. Did you guys get some good stuff out of this this morning? Yeah. Amen. Yeah. Praise God. Praise God. Well, we're going to... We're going to move into ministry. I think Brother Othniel is going to come up. He's got some instructions for us. I think he's coming, maybe. <laughs> but we're going, to, we're going to move to a time of ministry now. Uh, for those of you that have cards, I think we're going to have you come forward. He's going to line you up. So I think we're going to take a quick break here. I'm going to get a drink of water, and then we will move into a time of ministry. Can we just give God praise and glory? Come on. <laughs> Hallelujah. Amen. God is good, isn't he, church? Come on. Amen.